Right now, the day's biggest news stories from a Vegas perspective. This is the Vegas Take with Sharp and Shapiro. All right, welcome back. Rolling out the red carpet, baby. Hour number two. It is the Vegas take on a hump day. Sharp and Shapiro, see when guest hosting today as well. It's so funny because I I heard I got a few text messages from a couple of people that are that uh, people in the media in Las yes. Vegas that know nothing about this guy Marcos Arroyo except what we know and what we've read about him. And that you know that's fine. They're entitled to their opinions. We're a great hire, great hire. If you don't know anything about him, how can you form an opinion? You know, that, that, that's that's kind of my take on it. So it's we, a very optimistic outlook right yeah, there if you are if you right. have no idea what's going on yeah. and still want to well, chime I mean, in. My, so if you don't... They seem to be the highest paid coach in the Mountain well, West. Well, that's my question. Let's ask let's ask yep. the man we have. With, I said, let's get somebody on the line that actually knows something about this guy. Yeah. And uh, he writes, of course, for the Oregonian and Oregon Live. Uh, Dr- James Crepia joining us now on the line. Uh, James, I appreciate you joining us on sh- such short notice. How are you? Doing well. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing great, James. So, James, as I just said, uh, I don't know a lot about this guy, except that he's been a coach for, what, about 16 years, a former uh, quarterback at San Jose State. What can you tell us about this guy, Marcus Royal, that people in Las Vegas you think need to know? Well, he's a really strong recruiter. Uh, that's been evident by the players that he's managed to help bring in uh, over his three years at Oregon. Uh, a really, really strong recruiter. I mean, he was instrumental so far in the recruiting process of some of Oregon's biggest offensive commits, uh, both last year and this year in particular. I mean, their quarterback commit right now for the 2020 class uh, is really strongly tied to Marcus Arroyo. Now, I'm not going to suggest that he's going to like flip the UNLV or something. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of a demarcation, I would say, between the Pac-12 right. and, and the Mountain West. <laughs> you uh, think? The recruiting realm. Um, <laughs> yep. But be that as it may. And, and also uh, Johnny Wilson, who's a – four-star borderline five-star receiver uh out of the calabasas area who again arroyo was really instrumental in recruiting uh along with other members of the staff as well the point sure. is is you know several of their top offensive recruits over the last couple of years have been pursued by uh, marcus arroyo so he's a big-time recruiter uh, and as far as an offensive coordinator and play caller uh, certainly Oregon fans, uh, like many fan bases out there, uh, you know, they do a great job from the couch, uh, and will criticize and find ways <laughs> to do that. Uh, but ultimately this is a guy who led an offense that improved year, year after year after year, uh, and has a quarterback who's set to go in the first round of the NFL draft. Mm-hmm. And, uh, from UNLV's perspective, uh, in a program, you know, towards the bottom of the mountain West right now. I don't know how you're going to do much better than that. Is it, am I wrong? I, I believe he was making, and correct me if I'm wrong, James, 850000 a year at Oregon. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was so making that this year. He was due for a slight raise next year, and there is no buyout uh, with him leaving to be a uh, head coach. So I'm going to assume he's make, he's going to be making somewhere around $1.5 million a year at UNLV, but we're going to find that out at the press conference on Friday. So here's another question for you, James. Those are all great things, by the way, that you mentioned. We need players. We need recruiting. And, and what you just said, I'm really happy to hear that. With that said, 16 years as an assistant coach, has he ever been offered a head coaching job before that you know of? Uh, I would not be able to speak to every opportunity that may have come across, uh, but I would be a bit surprised if he had on one hand. On the other, um, I mean, I know you mentioned 16 years, but, I mean, he's 39. Right. Uh, you know, just, right. I mean, when, when you start off at the GA level, when you're sure. 23 and whatnot, sure. and what, I mean, you're, you're not being a head coach in the next, you know, couple sure. of years, unless you're Joe Brady, I guess. Right. Right. Um, maybe right. That could happen. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I, I don't believe so. Uh, again, he served previously as an offensive coordinator at Oklahoma State. Uh, he had the one year stint with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But uh, no, I believe this is his first head coaching opportunity at the FCS gotcha. level, at least maybe, you know, again, I, I can't speak to, if, you know, somebody at the sure. FCS understood. came along, but yep. um, understood. no, I believe this is his first big one. Yeah. If you're just joining us, speaking with James uh, Crepia does a great job uh, writing for the Oregonian Oregon live covering uh, the ducks football program. All right. So uh, let's put this in a, in a perspective here, James, what you know from this guy uh, as an offensive coordinator for people that are not familiar with Oregon football, how do you think he's going to run the offense here at UNLV? What type of offense uh, uh, does UNLV football look like next year? And I know you're not very familiar, obviously, with every player that UNLV has, but in general terms, what do you think the UNLV offense will look like in the coming years under Marcus Arroyo? Well, systematically, uh, what he ran at Oregon was uh, a 
pistol offense in that insofar as you know it's a pistol formation it's it's kind of a misnomer that it's the full offense it's not a scheme it's it's a formation uh so formationally you're going to see a lot of the pistol a uh, pistol and shotgun kind of a combination of the two uh i don't know if you want to call that spread or not spread i mean everybody's got kind of a wide umbrella definition of what that is but a lot of three wide sets basically uh out of the pistol or, or shotgun formation and uh, again, for Oregon fans who are some, some of them, you'll see it out there in social media. Uh, for if you're UNLV fans, seeing what the Oregon reaction is to this, don't go only by what the Oregon fan is reacting to, uh, because the Oregon fan had enun- basically an- anointed uh, expectations on Justin Herbert for his return this year, and some of them were completely outlandish. Uh, and the they had every answer for everything that was ailing this top 15 offense. Whether they wanted a six foot six, two hundred and forty pound quarterback to run the ball a lot, I can assure you, if UNLV is fortunate enough to ever get a quarterback of that size and stature, Marcus Royal is probably not going to run him very much. <laughs> right <laughs> now, now if he gets a quarterback who's a little bit more mobile, uh, perhaps he would be more open to that idea. But again, mainly formationally, like I gave you, pistol three wide. But he's a strong believer in the run. I mean, even going back to Oklahoma State, look, you know, he had Justice Hill playing for him. Yes, mm-hmm. he's had thousand yard receivers as well. Uh, but he recruited Chuba Hubbard to Oklahoma State, and he mm-hmm. went up way, way up into Canada yeah, he uh, did. to get him. And, uh, again, mm-hmm. he also was instrumental in having C.J. Verdell here uh, have back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons. So it's not just about a Justin Herbert who's developed and, and improved his statistics year over sure. year um, for like several years under Royal. I would say it's a strong foundation in the run game. But formationally, uh, yes, a little bit out of that pistol. Uh, so, James, obviously over the course of time, the media is going to get a chance to, to get to know this guy. The fans are going to get a chance to get to know this guy. But I want to ask you right now in your interactions with him, can you give me just a, a little bit of uh, background on just his personality? Is he going to be like a, 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 a screamer on the sidelines? Is he going to be that tough, you know, tough guy in your face? Uh, is that his personality or is this kind of a guy that's a little bit more laid back? Every coach has a different personality, right? Can you give us a little perspective? What is this guy's personality? How is he like? How do you think he's going to be like dealing with the media? as a head coach and what is he like on the sidelines well in dealing with the media i can only go by uh basically our weekly interactions and uh i would call them more uh, press gaggles than press conferences it's kind of a more it's not a, it's not in a room it's kind of outside so it's a more informal setting but uh he's he's got a personality to him now i, I can't say what he's going to do on the sideline because he coached from the box as right a coordinator. right of course um so that's going to be frankly that's going to be an adjustment for him he's been up in the box for years uh, I actually, off the top of my head, couldn't tell you the last time he was down on the sideline. Probably was as uh, you know in the GA world or, or what have you. For all I know, he was charting plays at that time. I, I really don't know. Um, so what, with him being on the sideline strategically and certain things as far as, like, I couldn't tell you Oregon was quite aggressive on fourth down this year. Some of it was due to the fact that their field goal kicker wasn't very good. But be that as it may, does that mean Marcus is going to be go- is a pure analytics guy and he's going to be going for fourth down a lot? I couldn't tell you. Um, maybe. I know he's pretty big into analytics. He is a strong believer in a, a lot of uh, efficiency measures and things like that. So there's there's that aspect to him. But personality-wise, I think you'll have a little bit of uh, of flair and caginess to him. But no, is he is he a guy who's going to be like super in your face or anything like that? No, that's I would not. I'd say he's kind of between the uh, laid back. Uh, means and also uh, again has has a little bit of a wry sense to him at times, um, but you know how much do you so, show that as a coordinator versus how much you show that as a head coach? I mean, you find out when somebody gets in that chair, kind of thing. Uh, but no, I would not say that he's a guy who's you know is he a huge rah rah guy who's going to be going bananas? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> but then again, like I say, you become the head coach, you're on the sidelines, a little bit of a different situation, but he's a bit more laid back. So, James, a kind of an extension off of Brian's question there regarding his mentality and his approach. Uh, he comes from, he go, ends up going from Eugene, right, where he's an assistant coach, where it's all about, I, look, I've never been to Eugene, but I would expect it's all about Oregon football there and pretty much nothing else, right, to going to Las Vegas where, make no question, make, make no mistake, uh, UNLV football is not exactly the main cog here that people are focused on. So he's going from that market to here in Las Vegas. James, I don't know how much time you spend here in Vegas, but uh, your thoughts on how he will respond and react to going from an assistant coach there to now coming here to Las Vegas and being the head coach at the program at uh, UNLV. Well, yeah, this is definitely a, a Ducks obsessed market for sure, and I understand mm-hmm. the differences uh, in the two. But above all, again, we go back to recruiting. Uh, I think the Vegas area 
in the greater Southwest uh, where Marcus spends a lot of time uh, recruiting for Oregon. Uh, I think that kind of serves well for him in this capacity uh, for one. And two, let me look, let's face it, whether it was Marcus Roy or anybody else at UNLV guys, whoever the head coach was going to be, they, they were always going to be taking over a program that needed to be built back up. So the idea that they're not the top draw yep. uh, now or probably for the foreseeable future, um, I mean, no kidding. I and mean, they, they need to go out and prove it. And they need to go out and build. And frankly, the best thing for whoever the head coach is going to be, and it happens to be Marcus, is that in year one, you know, the growing pains are going to be ignored by a good number of people. I mean, let's face it, for the average person who's maybe not, you know, the diehard, you know, Rebel supporter, they're not necessarily going to notice all the growing pains along the way and some of the adjustments and implementation. But you start to see it more in year two and three, you hope. Uh, I think that's kind of the advantage of the position, frankly. But is the draw of being in a new facility uh, stadium-wise and then the new facilities that UNLV is building, is that all really appealing? I can imagine, yes, as a head coach, that would be. Uh, rather big from the recruiting perspective again to when you're trying to bring in just a higher caliber of player than UNLV's had uh, over the past couple of years. Yeah, that's all part of that process. So mm-hmm. how is he going to adjust to, uh, you know, going from being in a you know major spotlight in the, as a Pac-12 offensive coordinator of a na- you know national caliber program to being a head coach of a building program? Hey, that's, that's part of the process. But like I said, I think you kind of like the anonymity, relatively speaking, mm-hmm. uh, early on because – you don't want all the faults to be pointed out when there's going, when you, we all recognize there's going to be flaws and faults and, and issues sure. along the way, because that's the building process. Yeah. I guess, I guess I could have boiled it down James to this. Uh, does he know what he's in for when he's coming here in Las Vegas? Because uh, you know, it's, it's, it's safe to say it's going to be a tough task. And like you said, regardless of who the head coach is. Oh, I don't, I don't think that uh, it, this is beyond, beyond him as far as just the general idea that, mm-hmm. yes, that this is obviously a building situation, but a program that has oh, yeah, and a lot of the resource infrastructure uh, and things in place. Uh, I don't think that him or any other candidate is going to come along um, that any of this is new information to them. No, I think that this yeah. is uh, the, the gravity of the situation. I don't think escapes him at all. And I think it's a challenge that uh, clearly – uh, makes a lot of sense for him. Again, he was a, a top coordinator at a top 15 offense as a quarterback destined for the first round, wants to be a head coach, and this is the kind of opportunity that comes along that makes sense, uh, frankly, for Marcus to take. So, yep. hey, best of luck to him. And uh, like I say, it, it may take a minute, obviously. It's not something that, you know, he's going to turn it around in, in one year and have, you know, some grad transfer guy come in and then all of a sudden everything's fixed. Yeah. No, it's probably going to take a while. As part yeah. Of the make no mistake about it. Or anybody else. Yeah. Make no mistake about it. If we got Nick Saban, he wouldn't be able to turn around <laughs> any here either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> listen, James, I, I really appreciate your perspective and you probably gave the listeners more information on this guy than anybody else in this town this morning. So I really appreciate you coming on on such short, short notice. Can you give out that information, how people can follow you, your publication, uh, you put that out there for us. Absolutely. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at James Crepia. That's spelled C-R-E-P-E-A. Uh, read my work on OregonLive.com. Again, everything on the Ducks, but yes, we'll be following through uh, with stuff here with Marcus. In addition to some other things, because the question of whether or not he'll coach in the bowl game, for example, mm-hmm. uh, is something that both sides have to be. Uh, mm, have to be that's a good Friday. question. Yeah, good that's question. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll say this with the, with the recruiting dead period, with the early signing at that point over with, because we're only talking about a week from now, <laughs> and then the dead period thereafter. Mm-hmm. Plus, he has $30,000 in bonuses contingent on his coaching in the game. So I'd say that there's a pretty good reason for him to coach in this bowl game um, <laughs> for, yeah. for both the short term and, 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 frankly, for the UNLV perspective. Because, no doubt. one, it really doesn't harm him as long as he's able to assemble a staff in the background right. uh, and balance that. And, two, uh, from a recruiting perspective, you're on national television and, and you have an opportunity to be talked about as the next head coach at UNLV. Yeah. Uh, they'll show him in the box, call and plays, and as long, you know, as long as it looks good. Uh, it certainly makes a lot of sense from a recruiting perspective to coach in the game. So financially, economically, and certainly from recruiting and, and going forward perspective for all parties, it I'm makes o- sense if he does coach in the game, but we'll find that out. I'm, again. O- I'm Check o- that out on OregonLive.com and et cetera. I'm okay with him wearing an Oregon shirt. you think there's any chance we could get him to wear a UNLV hat up there in the box? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> if, he, if he sticks around, uh, I'll be sure to ask him what, what <laughs> Fair the enough. day guard will look like. Hey, hey, hey James, off off the kilter question. If Breedland stayed healthy, would Oregon won the Pac-12? Well, I mean, they won the Pac-12. I mean, would they be going to the playoff? Right. They've avoided the, the loss of ASU. Right. Uh, I mean, it certainly would have helped, but I mean, ultimately. 
look, they had two losses. Breland was there for the opener. Maybe if they had one of the other receivers in the opener, but that's not the game that cost them. The ASU game, uh, some fans are still harping on the offense on that one. The offense is the one lost that game. Uh, what lost that game is over 500 yards on the defense that had played really, really well all season. It's an outlier, but the defense made Jaden Daniels, who could be a phenomenal quarterback in the years to come. I agree. Arizona State. They made him look like a Heisman contender. And, I mean, bottom line, you can't allow an 81-yard pass on third and 16 in a one-score game inside six minutes. It's almost unprecedented in college football. You can't allow that to happen. And that's not on the offense or a Royal or an injured tight end. That's that's just you cannot allow an 81-yard touchdown on third and 16. No doubt. So, um, that's, that's what lost that game. But would he have made an impact down the stretch? Yeah, I mean, that's a guy who, like I say, for Oregon fans who have been critical at times of this offense, that's a guy who – Look, midseason All-American, if it weren't for the injury, he absolutely unequivocally would have won the Mackey Award. There's no doubt in my mind. He is only one touchdown below the Mackey Award winner, who was just announced this morning. And that's not knocking that young man. He's a thousand yard receiver at FAU. But a thousand yard receiver with seven touchdowns at the tight end position. Breland had over 406 in six games and got hurt. And a Royal coach tight ends a year ago. He changed, uh, he, he, they shuffled the staff to remove that responsibility from him. So he developed a guy like a Jake Breland into a Mackey Award caliber player prior to that injury. Would he have made a huge difference to the offense? Absolutely. But it wouldn't have changed the outcome of the two losses they had. This year. Well, James, I can't thank you enough for your time, my man. Thank you so much for your perspective. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work, and uh, hopefully we can catch you soon uh, down the road. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. All right, there yeah, you thanks go. Thanks a lot, That's James. James uh, Krapia joining us from the Oregonian and Oregon Live, giving us a perspective on UNLV football's new hire, Marcus Arroyo got some good perspective from him. Good recruiter. That's certainly good to know. We need a quarterback. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we have to follow the breaking news, everything that's going on in the political world. Uh, Joe Biden saying that uh, he's not going to run two terms if he wins. And then you're not going to believe, or maybe you will believe, some of the stuff that Donald Trump said in a campaign rally last night. We have it for you coming up next. You're listening to The Vegas Take right here on the all-new 101.5 FM, 720 AM, KW.